wife, mother, duchess. A journey from working class to Windsor. Kate Middleton's rise to royalty and influence is of international intrigue and admired the world over. Taking her place on the global stage overnight, tying the knot with the Duke of Cambridge and swiftly making monarchy history in the form of their firstborn and third in line for the throne, Prince George Alexander Louis, we document her incredible journey and delve into the often undisclosed but sought after history of who now is known worldwide as the Duchess. She is probably a good example of one of the best things that the royal family has done for years. She is a very a beautiful young woman who's very intelligent and rather polished. You can say anything you like about the Duchess of Cambridge, but you can't accuse her of not being impeccably well brought up. Born the eldest sibling of three, Catherine Elizabeth Middleton was born in Berkshire, England. Raised by mother and father, Michael and Carol Middleton. Both, of highly different backgrounds, found love was in the air as they incidentally met at Carol's occupation as an air hostess and father Michael's job as an international dispatcher. It was on Michael's side that a glimpse into British aristocracy was already prevalent, born into a wealthy family from Leeds, West Yorkshire. And Carol's side, a decidedly working class group of coal miners and builders. I think the way the Middletons have been integrated into royal life, so to speak, has been quite seminal and unprecedented. Often girls would marry into the royal family and their in laws would sort of be ignored or shoved away. The Middletons are hugely interested, a family that's married into the House of Windsor. And what they did is what good parents have always done they've invested in education. It cost them a lot of money. They sent all of their three children to good schools, uh, in the case of Kate, to Marlborough School, which is one of the top public schools, which means private in British terms, schools, where she did quite well. It was thanks to this success that Kate, sister Pippa, and youngest brother James were set for an interesting, diverse, and financially forward upbringing. Becoming a student at the University of St Andrews in Scotland, it was here that she first became aware of Prince William of Wales, all through the fortune of sharing a dorm room during her time there. The pair shared several classes during their studies and soon became friends. She was popular, she was diligent, she worked hard. Um, she ended up going on to Down House um, at the age of 13. And she had two pretty miserable terms there. She didn't like it, she was picked on, she wasn't academic enough um, and she really felt the pressure there. So I think after two unhappy terms, her parents decided that they would pull her out and they went to try Marlborough. Uh, the uh, mixed school now in Wiltshire. At the university they shared rooms to start with and then shared a cottage with some friends and as they said you know by their own account they said that they were friends first and then the romance began and it, it, it seems that the royal family were protecting William it's, it's about William to start with but then William and Kate when the relationship began because they did a lot of their early courting in, in St Andrews at the Queen's estate in Balmoral away from prying eyes lots of privacy lots of time to develop the relationship. They were friends at St Andrews University before they went on to start going out with each other. Kate at the time counselled William in changing his course. He didn't like what he was studying and she encouraged him not to leave and go back down to London but to stick with it and do something a little bit different. It wasn't until 2002 after Kate's appearance in an exclusive fashion show fundraiser that William became more and more intrigued by Miss Middleton, especially the dress that she was wearing that evening. We have a very particular picture of him in that respect. She's quite reserved but you know this the same girl that when she was trying to pull Prince William, she, you know, she was wearing a see-through out dress and, and sashayed down a, a catwalk. So, you know, that was quite a bold thing to do. 
Um, so she can't have been shy or backward at coming forward in that respect. So I think we get one impression of her in that respect. When they split up, she went to a, uh, a bunny girl party dressed with the ears and everything. So look, there's got to be two sides to her. But at the moment, she doesn't really um, seem to want to put a foot wrong. Does it occur to you that it's somewhat inappropriate for a future Queen of England to have been photographed in? <laughs> It does, but um, back then, I'm sure she had her reasons for wearing it. I, we still don't know whether she was putting it or if she chose to wear it, which I like to think she chose to put it on because she thought it might be a bit of a showstopper. It's a part of history. Such a bond together, particularly on his side, was the fact that they had kind of quite... <laughs> Wife, mother, duchess. A journey from working class to Windsor. Kate Middleton's rise to royalty and influence is of international intrigue and admired the world over. Taking her place on the global stage overnight, tying the knot with the Duke of Cambridge and swiftly making monarchy history in the form of their firstborn and third in line for the throne, Prince George Alexander Louis. We document her incredible journey and delve into the often undisclosed but sought-after history of who now is known worldwide as the Duchess. She is probably a good example of one of the best things that the royal family has done for years. She is a very a beautiful young woman who's very intelligent and rather polished. You can say anything you like about the Duchess of Cambridge, but you can't accuse her of not being impeccably well brought up. Born the eldest sibling of three, Catherine Elizabeth Middleton was born in Berkshire, England. Raised by mother and father, Michael and Carol Middleton. Both, of highly different backgrounds, found love was in the air as they incidentally met at Carol's occupation as an air hostess and father Michael's job as an international dispatcher. It was on Michael's side that a glimpse into British aristocracy was already prevalent, born into a wealthy family from Leeds, West Yorkshire and Carol's side, a decidedly working-class group of coal miners and builders. I think the ways the Middletons have been integrated into royal life, so to speak, has been quite seminal and unprecedented. Often, girls would marry into the royal family and their in-laws would sort of be ignored or shoved away. The Middletons are hugely interested in a family that's married into the House of Windsor. And what they did is what good parents have always done. They've invested in education. It cost them a lot of money. They sent all of their three children to good schools, uh, in the case of Kate, to Marlborough School, which is one of the top public schools, which means private in British terms, schools, where she did quite well. It was thanks to this success that Kate, sister Pippa, and youngest brother James were set for an interesting, diverse, and financially forward upbringing. Becoming a student at the University of St Andrews in Scotland, it was here that she first became aware of Prince William of Wales, all through the fortune of sharing a dorm room during her time there. The pair shared several classes during their studies and soon became friends. She was popular, she was diligent, she worked hard. Um, she ended up going on to Down House um, at the age of 13. And she had two pretty miserable terms there. She didn't like it, she was picked on, she wasn't academic enough um, and she really felt the pressure there. So I think after two unhappy terms, her parents decided that they would pull her out and they went to try Marlborough. Uh, the uh, mixed school now in Wiltshire. At the university they shared rooms to start with and then shared a cottage with some friends and as they said you know by their own account they said that they were friends first and then the romance began and 
it, it seems that the royal family were protecting William. It's, it's about William to start with, but then William and Kate when the relationship began because they did a lot of their early courting in, in St Andrews at the Queen's estate in Balmoral. Away from prying eyes, lots of privacy, lots of time to develop the relationship. They were friends at St Andrews University before they went on to start going out with each other. Kate at the time counselled William in changing his course. He didn't like what he was studying and she encouraged him not to leave and go back down to London but to stick with it and do something a little bit different. It wasn't until 2002, after Kate's appearance in an exclusive fashion show fundraiser, that William became more and more intrigued by Miss Middleton, especially the dress that she was wearing that evening. We have a very particular picture of in that respect. She's quite reserved. But, you know, this is the same girl that when she was trying to pull Prince William, she, you know, she was wearing a see-through out dress and, and sashayed down a, a catwalk. So, you know, that's quite a bold thing to do. Um, so she can't have been shy or backward at coming forward in that respect. So I think we get one impression of her in that respect. When they split up, she went to a, uh, a bunny girl party dressed with the ears and everything. So look, there's got to be two sides to her. But at the moment, she doesn't really um, seem to want to put a foot wrong. Does it occur to you that it's somewhat inappropriate for a future Queen of England to have been photographed in? <laughs> It does, but um, back then, I'm sure she had her reasons for wearing it. I, we still don't know whether she was putting it or if she chose to wear it, which I like to think she chose to put it on because she thought it might be a bit of a showstopper. It's a part of history. Such a bond together, particularly on his side, was the fact that they had kind of quite different, I mean, very different backgrounds. He obviously had had his parents had gone through a divorce and then he had tragic death of his mother whereas she was quite an ordinary girl by all accounts she lived a quite idyllic life her family got on very well it was all very harmonious and it was almost like she brought something new to the table for William and so he found a bit of solace in the fact that she had such a tightly knit family he really enjoyed going to visit her parents at weekends and I think that probably gave him something that he didn't have from his own family. After a complex start for the pair romance was in bloom. The relationship was held closely undercover, mostly due to the prince's extreme distrust of the press. However, a slipping cautious approach led to Kate being caught by paparazzi while on a royal family ski trip, leading to an immediate response and their relationship being the subject of intense scrutiny, prejudice and tabloid attention. Rumours spread that Middleton was certainly more than a close friend, and some tabloids led the headlines, suggesting she was being groomed for a potential position of royalty. What you have with William is a guy who has learnt lessons, and there's really nothing any of those grey-suited men from Clarence House could genuinely tell William that he doesn't already know about the press. And he understands the media. He understands that, as a royal, you're never going to be elected but that doesn't mean that public opinion isn't incredibly important um, to you and your longevity. And William, I think, really understands that. He gets it. Um, he is very, very open and willing to forge relationships with the press. Um, but he wants it on his terms, and he does not want a repeat of what we saw with Princess Diana. At all times, they were highly discreet. They were almost never seen together. They were, even with their friends, they didn't allow any gossip to start. The people speculated, but there was nothing uh, definite which proved that they were an item. And I think the fact that she was discreet and that she wasn't blabbering on about um, her, her love or her, her, her regard for Prince William, I think that stood her in good stead. I think everyone was terribly nervous, um, not least William and Kate. I mean, it was the first time they had met the British media. Um, you know, I'd seen them at nightclubs before. I'd spent my time, you know, watching them at polo matches and charting this amazing relationship. Um, but the first time really to actually sit down and talk with them, I remember Kate being very nervous, but incredibly sweet and kind um, and interested in what we were doing and how we were the story um, and they, they both just seemed so well matched you could see it in their body chemistry even at that stage um, and on in a moment you know fraught with nerves they were about to meet the world's press all the paparazzi and the photographers rather were waiting next door to take their picture I remember William having his hand in the small of Kate's back you know guiding her making sure she was all right and I think that's what you've seen over the years you know he has wanted to just make sure that she is comfortable I think there's a huge amount of trust there not just between them but their circle of friend there so circle of trust, their closest friend who never dream of leaking anything to the press and really protect them. I think equally, one of the secrets of the success of their marriage is that they do seem much more equal than, say, for instance, Charles and Diana.
I think as well, Kate has been very careful not to upstage her husband. I think that she's uh, the yin to his yang in that he, although a level-headed, down-the-line kind of guy, can be prone to a few temper tantrums, perhaps, and likes to dig his heels in and knows his own mind. And I think can sometimes quite angry, one gets the impression that Kate's the one sort of pulling him back and reining him in and saying, all right, let's just keep calm. And I think as well, why Kate's brilliant for William is she has been so well brought up in such a loving and stable family, the kind of family, let's face it, the prince has never really had, that that's hugely grounding for him. And actually her middle classness uh, and her lack of aristocratic airs and graces and the fact that she isn't royalty is no bad thing because it dilutes the royal family a little bit and it reminds this man who has been brought up knowing nothing else but royal life, what real life is like. And I think for their children, that provides them with a much better grounding with which to grow up. Never before have members of the royal family been seen in the same way as we view celebrities, but Kate and William are a very good-looking pair. And because they come across so down-to-earth, I think we're viewing them in a completely different way. And Kate is already eclipsing all these A-list stars like Jennifer Aniston, Gwyneth Paltrow. She's the one that people want to know more about. She's the one that people want to dress like and just want to absorb every bit of information there is about her, which is quite exciting. This is a young woman who really wasn't raised in the public eye to any degree and also isn't a naturally gifted speaker. So with all the attention on her, and she's quite shy as well, it just complicates things and makes it very difficult. The first time we really got to hear her voice was in the interview when William and Kate announced their engagement, when she wore that very famous and much copied Issa blue dress. No, I really didn't at all. I thought he might have sort of maybe thought about it, but no. It was a total shock when it came and very excited. William a couple of times kind of answered the question for her that she asked or corrected something and was obviously very protective of her. She was not comfortable, very clearly, uh, speaking on camera. And then, of course, we saw her. Thank you for not only accepting me as your patron, but thank you also for inviting me here today. You have all made me feel so welcome, and I feel hugely honoured to be here to see this wonderful centre. I'm only sorry that William can't be here today. It's very difficult, I think, for anybody who's come from the outside of the royal family um, to, to a full-on public figure to be brilliant at public speaking straight away. Prince Harry seems to have got it almost instantly. He's, a, he's an excellent orator, and he does it with natural charm and fun and a degree of wit. I think that there's no doubt that Kate was very nervous when she started her role um, as a duchess and speaking publicly. Um, in her role as the um, patron of the East Anglian Hospice, she had to make a public speech. I thought it, she did very well, but it was a little stilted, a little disjointed. I think she would probably um, admit that she was more than a little bit nervous when she had to make it. Um, but in time, I think she's improved. Um, she's undoubtedly had some help, I would think, from external advisors. I mean, Princess Diana herself used Peter Settlin to help train her in public. In fact, she used to have marbles put in her mouth to help her speak more clearly. I don't know if Kate's gone to that extreme, but she certainly has improved. Um, she's certainly more confident. And from the time I saw her when she delivered her first speech to the one she delivered in Singapore, um, she, she, would, she was much improved. The couple's official engagement was announced in November 2010 during a vacation to Kenya, where William presented Kate with his mother's engagement ring. William's decision to give Kate, his mother's engagement ring. For outside observers, we might look at that and say, that wasn't a great marriage, really, on the grand scheme of things. I think what it means for William has a far more intimate meaning. Prince William will rarely ever talk about his mother publicly. He will very, very rarely do anything to kind of draw comparisons with him and his mother. Um, and certainly he hates the thought that Kate might be seen as the new Princess Diana. But his the decision to give her his mother's engagement ring I thought was very significant because it, it, it sort of showed that William wanted his mother on his big day 
to be right there at the very heart of of what was going on and and actually it was quite you know in a, in a non sort of soppy way i thought it was it was quite touching and the ring gives us all permission to look again at this union particularly because charles and diana's marriage went so bad and began we now know on such rocky foundations you know it, it may be that we're imagining it we're just hopeful and optimistic but it looks like this one is different it looks like this one is very much people would have inevitably made those comparisons private privately i i felt on the day when he, when when it was obvious that was the ring he'd given her i felt that was his way of taking control of that narrative and taking control of that story that's what i think it was william and kate to me are about the future i don't like to to look back and compare her to diana because she is her own woman and william and kate i think have their own idea of what they want to do the couple then announced plans to live in North Wales, where Prince William was stationed with the Royal Air Force after their marriage. Well, actually, William has got a kind of cake and eat it scenario because he's gone and retrained as an air ambulance pilot, which means he can remain flying, which is his first love. It also means he can have a career aside from the royal family. And it's in a perfect arena, of course, because he's going out and helping to save lives. Well, before I started Search and Rescue, I had a little brief uh, introduction to it, and it was immediate to me. Um, I spent three hours flying with the guys, and it was totally apparent to me straight away how important the job is, and the skills the guys employ, um, the flying aspects, the, the general airmanship you need to, to have around you, and all the wits you need to survive the weather and whatever sort of situation you're thrown into. Um, it definitely is advanced flying, and it's rewarding, so it put the two together, and it's a fantastic job. I think it's important that he has that time where he feels he's doing a proper job as well as the time when they spend together when they are working together as members of the royal family. No, no, it's, it's, it's pretty rich coming from a ginger. So I'm quite happy to uh, to um, him on this one. He's a good looking ginger, sorry. Peter's both. <laughs> after the official announcement of the pair's engagement, it was six months after, on April the 29th, 2011, that the marriage was to commence. The marriage, the ceremony, the wedding, just actually puts a seal on what everybody has been aware of for a long, long time. As Prince Charles said when he was asked about the engagement on the day it was announced, well, he said they'd been practicing long enough. So maybe we just ask your reaction to the wedding, please, sir. Yeah, obviously, obviously it's true. Thank you very much. <laughs> practicing for long enough. So it's been very important for the royal family this time around to make it clear that they're not trying to push the idea of some sort of fairy tale wedding. This is about a wedding between two ordinary people who love each other. And so they wanted to really par down all of that frivolity. So the dress was much more simple, for example. Kate arrived at the cathedral in a car rather than a coach. And so there were a whole load of subtle differences throughout the day to make that very, very clear. Closer eyes were on the dress that Kate was due to wear, designed by Sarah Burton, a fact that remained a secret until that day. In terms of style, Kate Middleton is very serene. She's not someone who would wear anything particularly outrageous apart from uh, the see-through dress she modelled in her catwalk show at university, which has appeared in every single paper ever since those two got... The kind of style that a lot of women actually feel that they could replicate because it's nothing too complicated and fussy. Yes, she's very tall and slim, so she can carry a lot, a lot more off than perhaps everyone can, but... She's just very, very well groomed. She seems to know exactly the kind of things she likes. She always wears kind of your your wraparound style dresses that are just down to the knee. Um, and she's now this real figurehead for style in all sorts of magazines. My magazine's writing about her all the time. So it's her dresses and particularly her hair and how you get it so glossy. I think Kate Middleton has enough courage and an individuality to choose from all over the world who she wants as her designer. Well, believe me, the decision about what dress designer all of the Middletons were going to use raged for some time, and it was a really difficult decision for them. For example, Carol Middleton, she was going to have a dress designed by Linda Chirac, and then she shoved that out of the way at the last minute because all of these women knew making a dress designer was so important. Tying the knot at Westminster Abbey in London, all eyes were on the most important royal wedding since that of Charles and Diana. This is when the English, the British, come to their own. We have all the equipment. We have the household cavalry. We have the wonderful carriages. We have those ancient Rolls Royces. And there's a great spirit here, a spirit I think you could say was evocative of 1981 and the wedding of Prince William's parents, Charles and Diana. There's a real enthusiasm for it. What my opinion of the dress was that it was uh, youthfully regal, 
it was modern with a classic twist to it, which was fantastic because I didn't want Kate to sort of lose touch of Kate in the whole pageantry of this occasion. And I think uh, Sarah Burton for Alexander McQueen did a sublime job. I think the, the lace was so effortlessly executed. It was almost as if she had like a white tattoo all the way down her arm. And the fine buttons. And then you saw that quintessential McQueen detail on the ruff of the spine. I thought the skirt was just enough skirt for a venue like the Abbey. I, I think, you know, to have something slimmer with a long train, she might not have filled that space with the, with the sort of... Um, ease as she did with this dress but I thought she looked very very beautiful very exquisite seriously polished royal sources tell me that the royals indicated very strongly to Kate that they would prefer her to wear her hair up for this very special occasion however Kate had her heart set on wearing her hair down with long flowing curls which is her favorite way to wear it and actually William's favorite as well they ended up compromising on her look she had kind of a half up half down so from the front she had an updo from the back she had the long flowing curls she wanted uh, to a fairy tale to lift your spirits in this world today isn't it Prince William looked fantastic in that sort of royals and blue red uniform, very unusual, matched the red of that carpet that went up the centre of Westminster Abbey. He looked marvellous, and the white gloves when he was waving at the crowds, he looked the dashing prince. If only he could have ridden up to Westminster Abbey, he would have been the perfect, perfect prince, wouldn't he? William and Harry, when they came out, I mean, it was all about metallics, wasn't it? I mean, especially with Harry, with the gold, with the gold braiding and frogging. Um, I thought William's choice of, of the red was fantastic. I mean, Kate's heart must have gone pitter-patter completely when she saw her prince standing there. And I caught that glimpse of Harry when he took, a, a, he took a, a sideward glance at seeing Kate while William turned the other way. And he said to his brother, she's beautiful. And that was really, really charming between the two boys. And it was very important to Kate that William be surprised when he saw her and he certainly seemed to be even getting a touch emotional when he turned and finally looked and saw his bride of course Harry at his side was peeking the whole time and even over was overheard saying to William she's here she's here uh, it was a very exciting moment very romantic moment Kate was met by Queen Elizabeth shortly before the wedding, in which it was conferred that her royal title would be Catherine, Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge. From the beginning, Kate Middleton had a great deal of support from the royal family, um, which was really instructed by the Queen, to make sure that she knew as much as she could possibly know in what to do in every situation, bearing in mind, of course, she didn't really grow up in this world. There were things like learning how to get out of a carriage without exposing your, mo exposing your modesty and things like that that you would never think you would have to learn, but of course a woman in her position would certainly need to know uh, how to weigh down the hem of your dress to make sure it doesn't blow in the wind. Uh, there were all kinds of small details, little bits of etiquette, how to sit, who to curtsy to, who not to curtsy to, um, what fork to use, whatever else, um, you know, that they felt she needed to know. She was actually given lessons on how to be a royal wife. Kate hopefully stepping up a little bit more and taking on more responsibilities in her own royal role and growing in confidence into her royal role. It is still early days, but I think there's a sense that we want her to perhaps reach out a little bit further than she has done. Um, but it's going to be softly, softly, 
They're in no rush, that couple. People forget William isn't heir to the throne, his father is. He's second in line, so there's still time. And the Queen is still going as strong as ever. So at the moment, I think maintaining the status quo is key. You know, once you married into the royal family, you became a Windsor and that was that. Well, it was different when uh, Kate and William got married. And, and when William asked Kate um, to marry him, he made it very clear that she wouldn't have to um, leave her family behind her once she married in to his family. He promised that they'd always stay a part of the family, and they have done, um, whether it's joining the Queen at Ascot or being on an important barge within the Queen's fleet at the Diamond Jubilee celebrations. Given she is a commoner, the royal family have a high opinion of Kate. Prince Charles in particular was close to her from the early days. Camilla has obviously become involved. Camilla Parker Bowles, now Prince Charles's wife, has become involved and even took her to lunch quite publicly before the wedding as a real show that she accepted Kate into the fold. The Queen and Prince Philip haven't met her as many times, but you wouldn't expect them to because they are still much more formal and ceremonial in terms of how they live their life. But they did, just the week before the wedding, manage to meet Kate's parents, which was quite significant too. Given the history of previous royal weddings, the question was how sustainable the relationship between William and Kate was going to be, and how long their partnership would last. However, it was clear that this was not your average pairing, and it was an opinion held high that their romance and longevity as a husband and wife showed no signs of stopping. I think the prospects for William and Kate's marriage are extremely good, and the reason I think that is because, quite uniquely for a royal wedding, their relationship grew out of cold winter nights spent in a university digs having spaghetti bolognese and talking about anything other than being a prince or princess. Their relationship has grown out of being just William and Kate. Um, and I think that that's something that throughout their married life, as much as they can, they will try and retain. And if they do, then the prospects for them staying together for a long time will be very good. I I think Kate and William have a good chance of making this work. They are both very committed to the monarchy. Kate has proven herself to be a team player. She's proven herself to be discreet. She's also proven that she's willing to put her own interests behind the interests of her husband. I think also they've been together for eight years. They've seen each other through a variety of circumstances. And William seems to be doing a much better job of preparing Kate for royal life than Charles did for his mother. So Kate has a, a support system in William. She has a support system in her family, which Diane also did didn't have and she has a man she's known for eight years and she spent an awful lot of time getting to know I think they've got a good shot they're a stable happy family they represent uh, what is good about marriage and what is good about um, uh, having an extended family and the royal family themselves that is part of their role um, I'm sure the Queen is delighted with that it's tough being married whether you're a prince or you're a pauper it's tough you have to work at it it's a constant uh, renewal every day. Uh, I'm sure that they will have their problems. They've had some problems in the past, but they've come through those problems. And as they say famously, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think they have got a very, very good basis for uh, uh, the marriage ahead. It was inevitable that when moving into royalty, Kate would have a fair share of comparisons to the late Princess Diana. Becoming Duchess of Cambridge left fans of the monarchy curious of how she would settle and her similarities to William's mother. People are always asking me, well, how alike is Kate to Diana? Um, and I always say that they're actually incredibly different women. Um, they look very different. You know, Diana was blonde, beautiful and leggy. Kate's beautiful um, and leggy uh, and brunette. So, you know, they, they look very different. They are very different people. And I think particularly Particularly in the early stages, there was um, there was a desire, largely by the press, to to sort of see how Kate would live up to Diana's image. And and I remember William saying that there was no expectation that these were big footsteps, and no one expected Kate to fill them. And I think what Kate's done, which is so commendable, and you really have to take your hat off to her, is she's forged her own identity within the royal family. She hasn't tried to emulate Diana. Um, you know, she's a style icon, but I'd say she's quite a reluctant. Style icon. She's wanting to put her stamp in other areas. Within the comparison, there are huge differences. She's 10 years older than the Princess of Wales was when she married Prince Charles. She's more educated. She's more experienced. She comes from a very stable family in which she's clearly very happy. Diana didn't have those things, did she? She had huge charisma, huge inspirational things that she did. And she had massive natural ability with people. You know, we've all seen it. We all know it. It's well documented and accepted. But Kate Middleton 
looks to be a different creature. And she'll just, I think she'll just show that herself. And you couldn't try and measure yourself against Diana because she was a really... Early ...seen as an icon like Princess Diana was. And I think that's because Diana was a, a f had, had frailties and faults as well. Kate hasn't really put those out there. She's almost too good to be true sometimes. And I think a lot of younger people find the overwhelming privilege that she has the fact that she may be stuck around too long to marry Prince William as both seeing a little bit um, against her. And I think were Diana here, I think she would approve of Kate Middleton. She might feel slight like some mothers do, oh dear, I don't want to lose my son to any woman, you know, but I think she would approve. She would see in Kate Middleton some admirable qualities and she'd feel that she, her son would be safe with her. I'm sure of that. I think she would approve of it immensely. I think it's really important that she doesn't look anything like her. I was thinking that the other day looking at the, at the engagement pictures. She's a beautiful woman. She's developed a style that's very classic. It hasn't changed dramatically over, over the years, but it's just a classic, more groomed version of what she always was, it seems to me. Whereas Diana was that, she was that cultish teenager, wasn't she, who didn't have a sense of style, wore clothes that were 20 years too old for her to start with. She really got it a few years down the line. You know, that, that was her, you know, her huge, one of her huge successes was fashion. But I think Kate Middleton's a different, a different life story. And I think that will be the bedrock of how she copes with that comparison because there is no comparison to be drawn. I think that's the ultimate cushion on which she can fall. Humanitarian work played an important part in Princess Diana's life, both at home and abroad. Her interests were reflected in the organisations of which she was patron or president. With her impact on such admirable work, it was seen fit that from Kate Stern from fiancé to duchess, she would also hold a pivotal role in similar contributions set out her stall that she wants to support in the first instance children so she's supporting some hospice charities each the east anglia children's hospices she's equally decided to be a volunteer scout so supporting children out and about enjoying country pursuits as she does she's also been involved in action on addiction so she's saying that she wants to help people she thinks that addiction is the root to quite a lot of society's ills be it children or their parents and so she wants to get involved in that and also because she studied history of art and is a keen artist and photographer there's her patron of the National Portrait Gallery and other artistic pursuits. And she's mixed them a little bit, so she also supports a cause called The Art Room, which helps children, uh, gives children therapy through the medium of art. And actually, she's been ahead of the curve on most of the choices that she's made. She's put children's hospices on the map, and she's also done a huge amount of good um, for mental health. Um, it's another cause that she's very much behind. So she will know how important she is as a patron to those charities to put them in that international spotlight. And she won't want to spend too long away from them. People often ask me why I'm so interested in the mental because I think that every child should have the best possible start in life. When I was growing up, I was very lucky. My family was the most important thing to me. They provided me with somewhere safe to grow and learn. And I know I was fortunate not to have been confronted by serious adversity at a young age. For some children, Maybe there are some here today. I know that life can sometimes feel difficult and full of challenges. I think that every child should have people around them to show them love and to show them kindness and nurture them as they grow. The challenge that so many people have is not knowing how to that first step of reaching out to another person for help, admitting that they're not coping, fear or reticence or a sense of not wanting to burden another means that people suffer in silence. The importance of support for these charities is no more prevalent than the work that Prince Harry has accumulated over the years. The conservation of wildlife, promoting sport amongst the young and healthcare across all nations. Kate has had to put in a great deal of work to do the same. However, this is no competition, as Kate and Harry have a long history together, of which she has gained support, been able to confide in, and most of all, a friendship. Well, Harry and Kate have a very warm, affectionate relationship. You know, Harry grew up without a sister and without a mother to a great degree, and Kate gives him a feminine perspective and a feminine uh, touch that he really was lacking, I think, growing up. And it's really nice for him to have that kind of family member. One thing I've noticed ever since Kate was on the scene is the closeness and the fun between them 
um, with her and Harry. I remember even the garter ceremony in uh, Windsor where uh, like Prince William was all dressed up in the fine robes of the 12th century garter order. And you could see William looking all very serious. But also Kate and Harry were in the audience and they were, he was just digging her and joking and making fun of his brother. And I'm sure that, that happens quite a lot because he is a joker, he is, he is fun. And, and it's quite a good relationship, I think, for her to have Harry as a, a, a brother-in-law. Prince Harry is somebody that's this lovable rogue. The British press can't get enough of him because he's this real naughty character and you've never known a member of the royal family to behave like him. He's the one you can always rely on for making the biggest gaffes possible. He'll turn up to a party in a Nazi uniform, completely unthinking about what he's doing. He'll go to lap dancing clubs. He's always seen stumbling out of nightclubs, looking very squiffy-eyed. You can guarantee he's the one that's probably the last person standing, the last person to have the drink. And I think... Prince William is the heir, and Prince Harry is the spare. Friendships within the royal family and charity contributions aside, the question on the lips of the nation after William and Kate tied the knot was how long it would be until the world would see a royal baby. For some, it was an agonizing wait until an official announcement in December of 2012 that the Duchess was pregnant. Obviously, there'd been an awful lot of uh, anticipation of, as when Kate was going to announce that she was pregnant. And in fact, I think the announcement was uh, suggested for about six months beforehand. Everyone was writing in the papers that she was pregnant. The palace had put out the official announcement as she was en route um, to the hospital uh, because she'd had problems with the pregnancy. And it was felt that William and Kate didn't want to even tell the Queen or Prince Charles that she was pregnant until they were absolutely certain everything was okay. The birth announcement for Prince George did not go according to plan. Kate was forced to announce prior to being... 12 weeks pregnant that she was in fact expecting because she was hospitalized for very, very severe morning sickness. You know, William and Kate had talked at length about how they wanted to make this announcement to the world, and it certainly wasn't going to be this way and at that stage in the pregnancy. Most celebrities, particularly royals, wait until that first trimester is finished before they make any happy announcements. But because Kate was taken very suddenly to the hospital because of her severe morning sickness condition, the palace was forced to issue a statement as to why she was there and the news of the pregnancy was leaked. Well, back in 2013, there was huge uh, celebration over the birth of Prince George. I remember broadcasting for numerous international networks outside Buckingham Palace. Of course, it was the great Kate wait. I mean, we didn't know when this little baby was coming along. Um, but when, uh, when it was announced that the Duchess had gone into labour, I mean, there was no space in that press pen, I can tell you. We were all very, very squashed together. When news broke of Kate actually having given birth, I think at 8.34 in the morning, on that Saturday, the press obviously instantly started speculating, well, will she leave today? And thinking as a mother, I thought, yeah, she definitely will, because you don't necessarily want to hang around hospitals too long, even if they are the Lindo wing and private and offering all frills. People sort of looking at their watches thinking, can she do this? Can she have a baby by breakfast and be home at Kensington Palace for tea? Um, and when we got wind of the fact that Kate's hairdresser had gone into the building, we knew, oh, hang on, you know, she's going to make an appearance. Um, and uh, in vintage uh, Duchess of Cambridge, she turns out in high heels and looking effortlessly elegant, even though she's given birth um, just hours earlier, which is a testament to her and how she's able to cope. Not only, I think, in the limelight, but just in this, with this pressure of having to present herself in a certain light. And I think, you know, hats off to her. Um, whether you love or loathe monarchy, um, any uh, mother out there will say that it was a pretty good effort to look so good. There was excitement. The royal wedding day when William and Kate got married, everyone was universally happy. Everyone was constantly checking the news feeds on their phone and on the television in order to see, waiting for William and Kate to come out from the hospital for the first time holding the new baby prince. Uh, I have several friends actually with news organizations who were standing outside the hospital that day waiting hours after hour for William and Kate to come out. And actually they came out quite a bit later than expected because typical uh, William and Kate uh, strategy fashion, they were greeting and thanking every single member of staff at the hospital personally for the very smooth birth. Um, they wanted to make sure they thanked everyone from the uh, cleaner to the midwife to the surgeon uh, to say thank you very much. So they, they did actually take a long time to emerge. When they did, Kate was uh, roundly praised in the press for her choice of dress.
I think it's just wonderful. It's lovely that the generations are going on and William and Kate are just such an asset to the royal family and Harry as well. Well, it's kind of surreal to think that uh, royal blood is uh, this close to us uh, at this very moment. of Prince George's birth, the joy that he brought to the world, and particularly yeah. to New Zealanders and Australians over the last couple of, last week and a half. And we have a tradition, just as a reminder, for when he's a bit older. <laughs> he, does, he does love it, honestly. With the arrival and reveal of Prince George, the royal reaction was that of warmth and confidence in both William and Kate, unearthing a new chapter of their legacy. It was not forgotten that one particular member of the family was now an uncle. He's great with kids, Harry. I mean, you only have to see him when he's out in Africa, as I've done with the kids that they sent to Bali refugees, and he's, he's fantastic. He's fun. He's, he's a big kid himself, I think he says it himself. And that, when you like, he's got to find the right girl first, I would have thought. But the fact is he, you know, he, he's very, very good with young people, and as an uncle, he, he'll be the best uncle because he'll be all the fun. I'm sure he'll be taking George to the fun fairs and, and taking him out as much as he can. Um, but... Uh, I think we get an impression of Harry as being all fun and not, not, not very serious. The truth is, Harry is quite a deep-thinking guy. Uh, he's, a, he's a nice person, and I think that with his, this birth of Prince George, it's probably made him feel a little bit broody, and maybe when he finds the right girl, it won't be long before he's a dad too. Prince Harry probably has the most fun with Prince George uh, out of the entire family because for, with Harry, he can be as cheeky and as silly and as wild as he wants to be with this little baby, and he has a great time with him. You know, one of Harry's best qualities is his uh, child childishness and his kind of open uh, personality and, and just finding fun in everything. And he really connects with George because George, from all accounts, is a very, is a baby with a huge personality and character. He doesn't just take a bath. He's splashing constantly trying to get all the water out. George is a really fun, free-spirited little boy. And I think Harry very much has that personality. And those two have a fantastic relationship. There's no question that Harry's going to be the favorite uncle, uh, possibly the favorite person for George, because he's so much fun. Another curiosity of the general public after Prince George's birth was that of following in royal footsteps, most notably the path of education he would lay and the social interactions he would have with other children born into royalty. Friends form the basis of a healthy maturity and are a key factor in development, so the curiosity stood strong as to who George would spend his early years playing alongside. In answer to who will be the royal baby's friends, well, obviously William and Kate have got their own friends who have got children of similar ages, um, so playdates have been arranged with them, and equally George's godparents have their own children. So they'll be mixing there in a social setting. Equally, you might have to remember that there are other great-grandchildren now that are of a similar age. So William's cousin, Peter Phillips, has got two daughters. You've got Zara Phillips, who is Prince George's godmother. She's got a little girl, Mia. Apparently, when those two babies got together and had a play date, it was, according to Mia's father, Mike Tyndall, the rugby player, absolute carnage and food was being thrown around and not going in either of the babies' mouths. So you've always got scope for a, a friendship there, but I think gradually, like, as with any child, you know, there will be children who the child meets as well through school. They will follow a very similar pattern to their own parents, and I include Kate in that because she was privately educated like William from the start. Schools would be appropriate and then move on maybe to Eton or even a day school, St Paul's, Westminster, something like that. My feeling is, though, that, that with both William and Kate being uh, educated privately, Kate at Marlborough, William at Eton, that they would follow a similar pattern simply because it's difficult, I think, for someone who's going to be the future king 
to be seen as just one of the boys or just normal because it's and therefore someone like Eton would give them or even some of the other top public schools like Westminster St Paul's would give them the peer group that, that would be easier for them to be educated in really. You know, Prince William is a very loving, warm individual, and he and Kate have a very solid and affectionate relationship. They want that to translate to their children. And although they do have some support staff, they have kept it to a minimum because they don't want outsiders um, in any way affecting the dynamic of their close family unit. Following on from the birth of the future prince, in an unexpected short time, it was announced that there was not just one royal baby on the cards. In 2015, it was revealed that the Duchess was again pregnant with her second child and with much less complications than with George. Both William and Kate were happy to announce that Princess Charlotte was on her way. And again, the world stood still as happiness reigned over the monarchy with the prospect of a baby sister for their son. Well, I think when it was announced that they'd had a little girl, it was, it was a great cause of national celebration. Of course, a little sister for Prince George, the daughter that Prince William had always wanted, the granddaughter that Charles had always wanted, but actually, historically, a really important little girl because she will hold her place in the lineage of succession. The antiquated male primogeniture laws were outcast um, just before Prince George's birth in case he had been a little girl. Now, had those laws not been changed and had the couple or are the couple to go on and have another child that may be a boy, well, Charlotte would have lost her place in succession. With the laws being changed, she will hold on to that position. She is the fourth in line to the throne and no little boy born hereafter will take that place away from her. So she is historically very, very important. Well, Charlotte's birth certainly does herald the dawn of a new era for girl power in that we have a girl in a prominent position at a se the senior end of the royal family. Obviously, with the Queen, the ultimate exponent of girl power on the throne. Um, but we face the prospect now of three kings in line. Um, so we're not going to see a lot, another woman on the throne for many, many, many years. So how lovely to have Charlotte in this role, bringing up the rear. She's rather unkindly called the spare to the heir, as Prince Harry is. But as he has proved himself, it's a role that you can make your own. And um, I'm sure all ours will be on Charlotte. In fact, there'll probably be even more scrutiny on her because she's female. But um, yeah, I mean, how great to have the pitter pat pink feet in the royal line of succession. They're very much hands-on parents. I mean, William made it very clear um, when George was born that he wanted to be a hands-on parent. He took time off to spend. They were very anti having an extended um, staff to look after their children, look after them. But I think as time has gone on, they've realised they do need that extra help. They can't just rely upon, say, Carol, Kate's mother, uh, and, and other members of the family. They do need that because they're very much in the public eye. Um, but William, in particular, wants to be a, a hands-on parent. Two, doesn't really want to pass on the responsibility of motherhood either. But, it, you know, when you're in the royal family, when you're in the public eye, it's very, very difficult to, to do everything. And I think that even Kate and William have found that, and so they are now realising that it's important to have the extra help that they require. I absolutely love it, and I, it's actually what I thought would be the name. I mean, Charlotte was picked as one of the, the top names that they predicted, and of course to have Diana in the name is perfect. William's got the princess he always wanted. Diana wanted a princess in the family. If she's got her wish, he's got his, and Diana's been remembered in the process. So it really completes it. They've ticked all the boxes. And the other thing about Charlotte is it's the female of Charles. So they've really done everything. Defying the odds set against her, the Duchess of Cambridge has proven to the world that she could not be more deserved of her position, and it is worldwide acclaimed that her commitment and love to Prince William allows this fairy tale to continue its life. The shock of Princess Diana's death and tumultuous time when married to Prince Charles is now seen as merely a shadow in the future of the royal family. Gone, but not forgotten, it has always been clear that Prince William found something in Kate that we had all hoped for a new sense of motherly love. You have to remember that as much as Princess Diana is, is, is famous for her warmth and, and, and just closeness to her boys, uh, they didn't, they very much did not have a secure, stable, warm family environment growing up. Their parents were divorced. It was very acrimony. Um, there really wasn't a, um, 
kind of uh, happy family for either of those boys. And uh, seeing it in the Middleton family has made a fantastically huge impact on William, and it is precisely the kind of dynamic that he wants to uh, bring into his own family life. Kate has made William so happy. She'd be competition in the glamour stakes. Uh, you know, Diana was an incredibly beautiful woman. She loved her couture. She loved to wear clothes as a fashion and power statement. Um, but I guess she'd probably be taking Kate shopping and I think they would have probably had a great friendship. But most importantly, she'd have loved Kate because Kate has given William what he always wanted, a, a wife to love and, and a beautiful family and great happiness. I think that Kate Middleton will be the people's princess. She won't be condescending to the ordinary people. She will be her own self. But I think there will be a lot of people who can identify with her and her background and where she's come from. And particularly as she succeeds in the job, I think they will warm to her. They will see that she hasn't gone out in order to get a prince. They'll see that it's been a mutually uh, arrived at relationship. And they will recognize that for once, this is a love match.
We have a very particular picture of in that respect. She's quite reserved. But, you know, this 
the same girl that when she was trying to pull Prince William, she, you know, she was wearing a see-through out dress and, and sashayed down a, a catwalk. So, you know, that's quite a bold thing to do. Um, so she can't have been shy or backward at coming forward in that respect. So I think we get one impression of her in that respect. When they split up, she went to a, uh, a bunny girl party dressed with the ears and everything. So look, there's got to be two sides to her. But at the moment, she doesn't really um, seem to want to put a foot wrong. Does it occur to you that it's somewhat inappropriate for a future Queen of England to have been photographed in? <laughs> It does, but um, back then, I'm sure she had her reasons for wearing it. I, we still don't know whether she was put in it or if she chose to wear it, which I like to think she chose to put it on because she thought it might be a bit of a showstopper. It's a part of history. Such a bond together, particularly on his side, was the fact that they had kind of quite